Welcome to Make Your Mark Live. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm super duper, duper, maybe another duper excited to have Barbie Keck on board today. She's hailing from some snowy location in the middle of somewhere. Let, Barbie, where are you? I am in southeastern Wisconsin. It was 70 degrees a couple days ago and snowing today and now it's sunny and and then it snows in a half hour so. You never know what's going to happen nowadays. Fun times in Wisconsin. Well, it's all because of the virus, obviously. Um, everything is because of the virus. <laughs> I'll blame you it know, on the virus. Deer acting crazily is because of the virus. It's it's amazing. But anyway, look, we have lots of, lots to cover today. I wanted to give everyone though a brief little intro about you, which is a total lie because there's not gonna, it's probably not going to be brief, but I'll try. Going backwards a little bit. I mean, look, the, the big thing is that you've got. What, a lot of what you do is you oversee a bunch of athletes that are involved with extreme sports, and that's a big thing. But um, part of that is a lot of the mindset and the training that goes into making them that you know elite athletes, elite at what they do, and that's that's a that's critical because you know we all have limitations physically, but a lot of times what really holds us back is what we think mentally, and really being finding that fine line between going too far and not far enough. And that's uh, that's a critical thing. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then also, you know, you've you've been an ice cross racer, um, a true to me. That's a true badass sport. There are a few others, but that's up there. Um, the whole notion of hurtling down a mountain, at, you know, give or take 50 miles an hour on skates with other uh, three other women trying to jostle for position. There's elbows flying, bodies flying. It's um, it's a crazy sport but it's a blast to watch so we'll hear about that in a few minutes and then before that oh you know just a couple other little things like houses burning down and uh, narcotics uh, work and so forth as an officer so you've you've covered a lot of ground but before we jump into some of that stuff give me a sense of you know give me one example of a time where you were actually like oh my god this is even crazy for me give me one crazy moment of your life the first ice cross race I went to I thought I was going to just I've been playing ice hockey with the guys my whole life lettered in high school with the guys and I just thought I was going to kick all the girls you know down the hill and I got there and I literally rode down the hill on my backside the whole time it has nothing to do with hockey <laughs> oh really I mean well no um no. how tell me a little bit about how it's um I mean, look, I know you're not really stopping necessarily at any point, although you're, you know, you're obviously going around turns and that sort of thing. You have to have the, I mean, you have to have similar, similar skill set, but how is it different? Well, like for us, it's about glide, right? It's about, and you're constantly on a, um, you're on an incline. So you're constantly leaning forward, not, not just leaning forward, but leaning forward more than you would ever lean forward. So if you think you're leaning forward far enough, you know, you're not. And then all of a sudden you hit a 50 foot, you know, gap jump and you're flying through the air and you have these two tiny little blades on your skates that you're going to land on. And if your ankles aren't strong enough or your body position is not right, if you're standing too tall, if your arms are, um, you know, we call it rolling down the windows or if they're like off balance, even just like a little bit, you're going to land on your head. That's not as comfortable as your feet, I'm assuming. Um, now, have you ever had the, have you ever wanted to go down and then do like a, you know, like what the skiers do, like the, you know, do one of these, you know, crazy or do a flip or do anything like that or not even close? They, they actually do have those competitions at the, um, it's just a, like a fun competition they have on Friday nights before the races. Um, if you watch it on, it's broadcast, the races are broadcast on NBC and Fox Sports and stuff. You get a chance to watch it. They usually play that because it's really exciting for the fans. But it's um, only certain athletes actually do it. So there's like I think six of them that are just they go all out. There's not a single ice cross athlete that just exclusively does like hockey or skating. They're all like you know hell hell of skiing and like um, wakeboarders and all kinds of crazy stuff. And they do, they do, they do like flips, they do corkscrews, they do, but it's, it's a trick competition. What's your um, other sport? If I had to pick one, <laughs> um, I'm a sixth generation scout sailor. 
Um, I think my family had me as a child to because my older brother needed a crew. Um, <laughs> my brothers are nine and ten years older, so um, they crewed for each other, and then I crewed for my next older brother. And when I got old enough, I crewed for my dad. My dad was the Commodore of our yacht club for like six times. My mom was the first female Commodore of our yacht club. My grandfather was Commodore three times. Um, so it's, so it's, it's in the blood, sounds like. Yeah. Um, it's not like what people think. It's not like, you know, we have a martini and we're sweaters tighter on our necks, you know. It's like doing a sit-up for two hours straight. A scow, a scow boat is a round-bottom boat. And um, we sail on inland lakes only. Um, and it's intense racing. That's intense for like two hours straight. Um, but then you have the martini. Or a margarita. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so look, uh, when did you start feeling it was a good idea to start working on, on your mindset and on, on the psychology side of things and on neurology? I mean, what, what was it that, that I mean, I, I know you mentioned earlier, you like to stay active and busy and learning new things and so forth. But was there a specific moment that you said, you know what, I better start learning more about this? Or was it, I'm just really curious about it? What, what got that started? I went to, um, at the time it was called the Riders Cup, and those are the um, ice cross races that are set up on ski hills, okay. and then the, the ATSX 1000 races, which are the big ones that Red Bull builds like inside Fenway Park last year, and um, I went to one race that I barely made it down in, and then all of a sudden I was invited to the, this big race in St. Paul, which had 200,000 people in person there. Wow. And broadcast on TV. And that was like, uh, I mean, all, all emotion comes down to fear. All negative emotion comes down to fear. And I started feeling fear the second I got the invitation. <laughs> um, not just like, I mean, it's, and there's all kinds of different fear, like um, fear of rejection, fear of embarrassment, you know, all that stuff. So I think I started studying up on it then. And it just, I found it so fascinating. Um, I'm one of those constant learners, can't get enough of, I'm actually doing another course now, um, I'm in the Flow Genome Project, um, and I just love studying the brain, the way the brain, the brain-body connection is um, one of the most important things that an athlete can do, starting from a very young age. So that's, that's, that's encouraging to hear because I think a lot of times people focus so much, especially with kids and young adults on the physical side and not, and not necessarily the mental. And, you know, I think that most coaches are not trained to really think from that perspective. And you've got, whether it's whatever the sport is, you've got coaches with so many different styles, but they don't seem to be similar in the mental training. And that's one that I think could be really improved upon. I'm sure you do too. What are, yeah. I mean, what do you think are some of the most, so, you know, I know you've done some work with kids and young adults and so forth. What, what do you think is the most important thing to really put on them or make sure that they understand at an early age? Um, to be in the moment. Um, we call it, you know, be here, be now. Um, it, it, when you're in the moment, there is no such thing as fear. I mean, literally right now, there is no such, there, no such thing as fear in the moment. Um, if I had, like, they, you know, kids as they grow older, they get, they have fear of their parents and their coaches, you know, and not being happy or, you know, they need to enjoy the sport. So if they can learn or, or you know, be taught to um, be focused about, like, where are their feet, literally, where are your, where are your feet right now? You're standing in this grass. What's the grass look like? Um, how does your how's your body feel right now? How does your jersey feel hanging on your body? Um, that brings them into the present moment. That's kind of the kind of things that you learn through. What, I don't like to use the word meditation, but mindfulness training, stuff like that. <clears throat> but you know, it, I'm talking about young kids. Um, and then the second thing I would teach is to parents about um, positive reinforcement. Um, I know it's, I'm not talking about like participation awards, but like you, you can't criticize the second they get off. They're already, they're already bringing themselves down and they, they know they made a mistake. You know, they don't need to hear it from the parent. You know, they're, they're just, that just makes them feel more 
more negative. You know, it's, um, I think that's the biggest thing I see when I go to competition, or mostly regardless of my kids. Um, so when, you, when you talk about positive reinforcement, because look there, I've seen, you know, innumerable coaches and parents, uh, especially, uh, you know, watching baseball and soccer, I mean, basketball, where, you know, the, let's say the kid strikes out, the parent or the coach says, you know, why did you swing at that pitch? What are you doing? What are you thinking there? What would you recommend that coach says in its place? In other words, should they be saying not, gee, that was a you know, great job, that was a really crappy swing <laughs> or something? Oh, and no, no. I, yeah, I totally understand. It's the best thing that they can do is not, not say anything about it at the moment. You know, the kid knows that they fucked up. They, they excuse my language. <laughs> they, uh, you can say up, they, sorry. They, yeah, they feel it, they know it. They, um, the best thing to do is just wait till like, you know, wait till a later moment and then have them recall. That's, that's a great way to, for kids also is to, um, you know, review their play and recall it, how, what they were feeling, what they were seeing, what they saw that made them do that. Did they see, you know, like the, the outfielder move in and there, or did they, you know, see the, the pitcher change his hands, you know, um, there are things that coaches don't see that the kids do and you can't just come down on them, but don't do anything at that moment. Just wait. And, and that's towards coaches. When it comes to parents, all they can do. I mean, when I say positive reinforcement, I mean like when they're done with their game, take them for ice cream. Don't even talk about the sport, you know, just, did you have fun? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, but just do something else. It's over, it's in the past. You can't change the past. That's what I mean by being in the now. You can't change the future and you can't change the past. You're just in what's happening right now. So let me ask you something, because that the, the whole in the now thing is, is really interesting to me because when you mentioned earlier about how you might tell someone and it doesn't it can be a, a, a child, it can be an adult, if you if you say to them, Look, focus on the now, but focus on, as you said, how the grass feels on your feet or on your cleats, or how does uh, the jersey feel on your back? If you mm -hmm. get people to think that way, is it almost like your uh, the brain is almost hijacking that feeling and or taking away the fear aspect of things? Like it's because, like you know, some That's, people talk about multitasking. I mean, I can barely single task. I can't multitask. So um, it's a, it's a proven scientific else. fact that you can't multitask. Uh, the oh. brain can focus literally on one thing in one moment. You can change from moment to moment. Like a moment is really fleeting, right? but it's scientific fact that you can only focus on one thing. That's one of my biggest strategies that helped me through some of the hardest times of my life. I do um, a five sense um, distraction technique. Um, if I start to feel an overwhelming emotion, first of all, I, let me just explain. Like, yeah. Emotions just don't happen. They come from thoughts. Thoughts create emotion, which creates a reaction. Right? It's pretty fundamental stuff. Um, but if you can recognize, which is like a big step, is to see or feel that stuff coming on, what you need to do is practice. Um, you can't change your thoughts. Those will, happen. Those will always just happen. You can change whether you respond or react to them. A normal person will just react. You want to respond to your thought. So like, you know, when you get really mad at somebody and you want to, you say, I want to kill you. Well, you don't really mean that. You're not going to really kill them. So you don't respond. So you, you know, you take the time and you think about it and you're like, that's not smart. Um, but yeah, it's just the, you know, going forward from there. And my technique that I use when I'm standing up, you know, seven stories up, looking down on this sheet of ice and 200,000 people, um, I use my five sense of distraction is what I call it. Um, I wear uh, my hair tie on my wrist and I can snap it. And I think about the sound, the feeling, the, um, the color. I sometimes I picture a vibration from it. Um, I chew gum and I'll, I'll take my mind and I'll start, I'll think about what all the gum feels in my mouth, how it, how it tastes, what it, the, um, what my tongue's doing, what, um, you know, how my jaw feels and just, that's another big one is relax your jaw. That's huge. Um, or relax your tongue. That's even harder. Uh, but, um, or, or another good one is to pick a color, like say, say orange, scan your environment, find everything orange that you can for two minutes. 
And it's amazing, not only does that distract from the emotion that was being created and the physical response, the biophysical response, um, but it also, it heightens your awareness, which is another important key to performance. Uh, you'll notice things that you've never noticed before. Even walking down your own street, you can do these, these, these I mean, that's the thing with mental training. You do it anytime, anywhere. You should be doing it all the time. I mean, there's so many different practices and techniques that you can try that um, once they're learned, you, you just you just constantly are having, you know, using them. So I'm a little concerned though, Barbie, because uh, has this ever happened where the announcers are saying, hey, look, why is Barbie still up at starting gate? She's staring at her bracelet and looking for something <laughs> orange. But, <laughs> no, 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 no. Because so, that, the, the emotion sets in long before that, and that, you know, that which triggers the fear. Um, I actually do have, uh, one trick that I use because I, it's like from a little kid when you, <laughs> this is totally just a made up thing. It's nothing I ever learned. But um, when you're scared as a little kid, you hide under the covers because the, the boogeyman can't get you. Okay. Or completely blacked out goggles. Uh, I did, was taught during mental training that um, like before a, a, a race or, you know, the only things that you can control and what you should do is show up. You got your hoodie on, your sunglasses on, and your headphones on. You don't look at anybody, you don't talk to anybody. You focus on your performance and what you want to accomplish and how you're going to accomplish that. You go through your pregame checklists, stuff like that. So everything is set in an order. These are just little techniques that um, you use before, before it to prevent it from happening, preventing the fear or the emotion from happening. Uh, now, now you've done uh, you know you've competed and and sort of been in i don't know if it's hundreds but probably hundreds of, of races do you um, still feel any sort of fear apprehension or is it just like this is i got this in sailing no in the when you're race ice cross like you're at the top oh. of the mountain do you still have that you see two hundred thousand people and you're on a sheet of ice do you still say holy shit uh, look out below or do you, are you now so used to it that you're in the moment automatically? Um, you never get rid of it. Uh, my brother is an F-18 pilot. He used to tell me that the day he walks up to his jet and he's not nervous is the day he shouldn't fly. That's great. That's, I mean, look, um, I mean, because that's when I think, I think that's when you let up, right? When you're too relaxed or you, you got, you know, when you've got that, not cocky, but you're so confident that you say you got this. That's when you right. let up and you, you, you miss mistake. that one little turn, right? Or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, moving forward, if it's, um, so I think that's great though, that with the idea of, of, of sort of teaching kids and young adults certain things, but let's say, um, you know, I'm an adult-ish, but I'm a, let's say I, I'm, I'm old enough to be one anyway. And I, I want to, uh, you know, be super competitive at whatever sport I'm playing. Let's say I'm, I'm playing hockey and so forth. Um, I mean, should I be still trying the same sort of pr preparations, the five senses? I thought that was a really good one. Um, what else, I mean, what else can I do? Maybe I'm at home, even I'm not at the rink. I'm not at the top of the mountain. I'm, I'm at home. What's a good way to, whether it's calm the senses or what, what are some of the things you like to do? Um, uh, yeah, the, a mental, a mental toughness isn't just for athletes. Um, it's for everybody. And I, th I will strongly believe that everybody should practice it. Um, the visualization one, or the, the, um, the five senses one is one you can do. Um, visualization is huge. That's my number one go-to thing because it's, uh, there's studies done that say that your brain doesn't know the difference between um, when you're visualizing deeply, meaning um, you incorporate things like um, temperature and smells and you know you really vividly imagine it and you actually feel yourself going through the motions and you do it perfectly your body doesn't know your brain doesn't know the difference whether your body's actually doing this or if that it's imagining it if you get to get it done correctly um, you can also do this with um, situational circumstances like that are negative so you're prepared. I, I've heard Michael Phelps used to do this because um, uh, in case his goggles fell off, and I guess it did or something during a race, 
um, but he prepared and visualized for, you know, his goggles falling off and mm. still. Win the race. I think Michael Phelps right arm could fall off and he'd still win the race. But um, anyway, but that's cool. So in terms of the, um, cause I was just thinking, um, I mean, sometimes, and this is, um, I don't even know why I'm bringing this up, but when I, when I have the opportunity to play golf every once in a while, I do my damnedest to visualize the putt going in. But even if it's a sort of on a slope, I visualize the path it's going to take, um, which it rarely does, but at least the visualization happens. Um, but would I be doing that also somehow, I guess, before, like in your case, um, with the ice cross racing, are you sort of visualizing the course in your mind the day before the, you know, the week before that sort of thing? Every day. Yeah. I I do visualization techniques, um, and I I teach six different kinds, but that's going way deeper. Um, but I do a morning and night, um, every day of, with ice cross. I'm talking all all year long. Um, and the thing with ice cross is that there's never one tra uh, you know the same track that we hit twice. So every track's different. But the best thing that you can do is you build like a highlight reel of moments that that um, you know that were, you were so proud and doing so, you were, you, you know, stick handling perfectly, you know, your skates were just, you know, whatever, you know, you were carving perfectly, you knew where your teammates were, you were just feeling that high, that flow. Um, hmm. And you, you make a highlight reel that, that you can play in your head at a moment of weakness. And that automatically brings you back up and you can do these visualization techniques using your highlight reel like just take your last game and see yourself playing that exact same team um you know see the exact the opponents you don't want to focus on opponents because you're playing your game for yourself so i i recommend you know seeing yourself the opponents are kind of just you know i do a, i do sports that um you know i just focus on myself or independence mm -hmm. Not, i mean play hockey but um you know, you, you see see yourself standing there, you should see your hockey stands. Am I low enough? And then visualize yourself sitting lower. Um, is my, you know, is my back straight? Is my, you know, is my chin up? Is my, you know, my peripherals, am I, am I seeing the ring? And what else do I see that I didn't see before? You know, you, I even use things like, um, um, <laughs> like cartoon character things in my head that like, where I know there's going to be a certain kind of jump that like, like say it's a tabletop um, and I know I'm going to launch off it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use like one, a cartoon explosion in my visualization. <laughs> so like, as I hit it, that, that cartoon explosion goes off and propels me forward and I land like a, you know, I'll pretend I have angel wings on my back that are fluttering, you know, and it just makes it stick a lot um, deeper. Um, the more details, the better. Anything that you can think of, the smells. Um, <laughs> hockey's got lots of smells, right? None of them, brother, none of them good. My brother, oh, I love the smell. My brother used to come home from a, a game and I'd grab his hand and <sighs> deep smell of a hockey, sm a hockey smell. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but speaking of hockey, though, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times uh, when you said, uh, you know, it's it's about you and not necessarily the opponent. What's interesting is when I play in my games, I never pay attention to the opponent and I never, I actually, I'm not sure if this is normal or not, but I never look at the opponent in their eyes or anything. It's They're just like the nondescript blob that's next to me and I need to play my game, you know, sort of that way, which is maybe not bright. I probably should pay more attention to who it is specifically, but... No, that's absolutely, I mean, that's perfect when it comes down. I mean, once you're to a different different level or you're at a more advanced level, you're going to want to study your opponents. Right. Uh, you're going to want to know all that stuff. But like like Wayne Gretzky, I just saw, watched a documentary last night. I think it was on, I don't know, something. Anyways, it was about sports. And Wayne Gretzky was on there talking about, um, you know, how he would watch every single game and know every single other player's stats and all this stuff. And in my mind, that's just too much overthinking. That's, um, that's bogging yourself down because you, you're only in control of yourself. You need to be very specific in being mindful of things that you're in control of and things that you're not in control of. 
and there's only very few things that you're in control of. So the things that you're in control of, that's what you can change. You can't change, like, I mean, if you're at a game, you can't change the ice conditions. You can't change, um, you know, the size of your opponent. You can't change, um, I don't know, your skate, you know, more, you need a chip in your skate, you know, you could have a sharper on the bench, but you can't change, you know, your equipment failure or your stick breaks, or um, you can't control any of that. But what's in your control is your preparation, your mindset, your, excuse me, your stance, your, um, all the practice goals that you had set, you set along the way to reach the main goal, which is the game. So, um, speaking of that, you, you mentioned a couple of, you know, these elements, but in your case, preparation, I mean, look, Everybody knows or has heard that, you know, if you really want to win, you need to, I mean, it's all about practice and preparation and being ready for that moment. Um, mm -hmm. and, and many of us know about um, the physical side. There's certain things we can all do physically to be ready for that moment. But uh, you've, you've touched on a few things, I, I guess, mentally, but are, are there any others that you can think of that, um, you know, let's say you've got, for example, uh, you know, a big race in, uh, you know, a week from now and it's it's um and you, you're going to need to travel in three days for you know three thousand five thousand miles to get there and that sort of thing i mean what kind of stuff do you try to do in advance because look you're you're competing against um i mean how many other women are i mean typically in ice cross it's um what is it you start with 64 or something and then you come down or how, how many uh, no there's 32 women international that are on the international tour you have to be invited to under the 32 and there only can be four from each country. Canada and the US are the only ones that have um, more than four in the top 32. So then that fifth one is kind of a backup, unfortunately, which kind of, I was in that position last year, but um, I made top four this year, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, preparation wise, um, yeah, there's it, a million things that I do. Um, starting now in the, uh, this is what we call postseason, and there's off season and there's preseason, but, um, there's things that we do, like when it comes to traveling, especially like, um, have your check. I'm a big, big advocate of journaling, of making lists, hand and paper lists. I'm talking about notebooks and pen and paper. Um, there's scientific research saying that when you make a list and then it, you accomplish something on your list, you and you make that check mark, and um, it's either dopamine and serotonin released. When dopamine was really or serotonin is released with one of them, and then once you check, make the check, dopamine is released, and when combined, that's when you get that runner's high or you know the the feeling of accomplishment. So sometimes, I mean, tell me you haven't done this. Make a list and then put a couple things on there you've already done, just so you can check them off. <laughs> right. I've never done that in my life. <laughs> Come on. I don't even <laughs> like, you know, walk the dog, but I already did that just so I can check it out. <laughs> I've never. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, okay. So in the morning, I mean, I do, uh, well, at 5 o'clock the night, the night before, I do a most important task, MIT uh, list. And in the morning, I make a very detailed um, list of things I need to do that day. A lot of my stuff is already planned for me, so I don't have control of a lot of that stuff. But the things I do have control of are the things that I need to get done as a, as a mom and as, you know, as, you know, in the house. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of aspects of my life. So when it comes to sports, that part of my life is kind of controlled by other people. And I'm told where to go, what to do, what to eat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they set my appointments for me. But there, I mean, there are things that I could take more responsibility for in that part. but um i don't i choose not to and my my lists during the day are so i so specific like um like i said i'll make a list like say this is a i'll do a morning list and then an afternoon a noon list and then a night list or like before bed list um and i'll include things like you know shower which is obviously just like a thing we all do just so i can check it off but you know it's, it'll be like you know wake up at this time um actually get out of bed at this time um and if so you make sure that you're out of bed by that time you know you don't sit in bed too long don't i don't have a 
strict no screens in the bedroom policy. Um, Barbie, I've already, so this is amazing because I've already learned a ton today and, and we're only about, you know, 25, 30 minutes into this, but the whole concept of cheating on the list is brilliant. I love it. <laughs> it's gonna, not cheating because you already did it. You did do it. I'm going to write down, take a shower. Right. Really? Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, exactly. That's not cheating. It's, there are things you need to do. Okay. So like, and it's, 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 a uh, it's, uh, it holds you accountable. Like, um, if you have to. You know, otherwise, sometimes, you know, you can convince yourself that eh, I just don't want to get up, you know, like, I want to lay here a little while longer, or um, I'm not ready to get up just yet, you know, or hit that snooze button again, whatever it is. Well, my list includes get out of bed at, you know, 623. Well, you know, it's funny is that um, I've got a dog that needs to be walked, so I guess he's got that on the checklist, and he crosses it off. Okay, woke his ass up. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm out of bed. That's great. Exactly. All right. Well, either you have accountability to that, right. that dog, you know, whereas other people have accountability to, you know, different. But when, especially nowadays, when everybody's stuck at home, accountability is a little lackadaisical. So if you, it's snowing now. Can you see that? It's sunny and snowing. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, if you, you know, you have to hold yourself accountable for your day or you're going to fall into a terrible rut of, of couch potato ness. Like, I mean, people, we're on homebound, you know, home lockdown, you know, and people are working from home, granted, but it's so easy to lose self discipline, especially from people, you know, in, in the corporate world and um, that are trying to work from home. And they're not necessarily being micromanaged now because they're independent, you know, they're working from home. And that's, um, you need to ho hold yourself accountable for every action that's in your control. Well, um, so speaking of that, for, for um, I don't want to say the non-athletes out there, but for those, I mean, because there's plenty of athletes who are now executives and so forth, but for the non-current athletes and so forth, what, you know, do you recommend then that, uh, you know, maybe not only we have checklists, but maybe there, there are sort of things that say, you know, we structure our day, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, do this, this, and this, and this, and not just, I mean, on one hand, to be held accountable to ourselves. But on the other hand, also, just as you said, that sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens if, because um, this happens to everybody, what if we kind of procrastinate or we kind of say, oh, well, I was supposed to do that 12 to 1, but eh, I'll do it 1 to 2. But then everything else stacks up and then, ah, eh, screw it, I'll blow it off. Right. Um, how do you counter that feeling? Because some people feel guilty when they blow things off, right? When at the end of the <laughs> day, some of that stuff they blow off is no one gets no one cares about right it's it's you know gee i didn't clean the closet today oh my god i'm so depressed well no one cares nobody cares the closet doesn't care so right. how do how do we get around that sort of feeling of um if it's guilt or you know not not accomplishing what we should have well i mean like you said there's always tomorrow feelings are controlled uh, emotion feelings are emotions emotions are controlled by thoughts you control your thoughts. Well, you can't control your thoughts, but you control how you respond to them. So you can respond with a different reaction. So um, you you have what's like a, a blueprint in, the, in your in your subconscious, okay. and, it, and those are um, programmed when you're a little kid um, that that's how you you react to this situation. The brain loves patterns. So when you um, when that blueprint was made. Um, you were told, you know, do your chores or you're going to be in trouble or you're going to be grounded or, you know, if you don't get your room clean, you um, can't watch TV tonight, you know, stuff like that. So you in your head already have this blueprint of a negative response if something doesn't get accomplished. That doesn't have to be that way. Those blueprints can be rewritten over and over again. The brain is has plasticity and we can change at any age, any time. Um, the way that we think of things, think about things, and how we react, respond to them, and not react to them. So a natural response is that guilt feeling. Um, <laughs> I don't get that guilt feeling. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I just thought of one. Like for example, you know, forever, you know, drilled into me was the whole notion of you know, you can't have dessert before dinner. That's ridiculous. And still to this day, I'm an adult. <laughs> I'm allowed to have ice cream before dinner. No one's right. gonna, 
but I won't because I can't. I'm not allowed to, right? Still, right. I, it's the blueprint that's sub set in your subconscious that, yeah. that you that you can rewrite at any any time. How? And I mean, you, you, you don't do. know my brain. It's not that elastic, by the way. My <laughs> my brain's pretty that's, solid. That's actually, but um, uh, it it is. You can you just pull up that blueprint. You just you just were mindful of it just now. You recognize yeah. it. So that's the first step is being mindful of it. So you have this, the, you pulled out the blueprint and now you can examine it. There's a, a technique that I call the five, I uh, can't remember what, which book it is, but it's the five whys. Um, ask yourself why five times and you'll come to the actual answer to something. Um, why, do you, why do you think you can't have dessert before dinner? Because my mom told me. Okay, why did your mom tell you that? Because if I had dessert first, I wouldn't eat my dinner. And why did she think that? Well, because I wanted to not eat my peas because I didn't like the peas because they were all shriveled up and gross. So did that really have anything to do with you not eating your dinner, the dessert? Having anything to do with your dinner? I, don't was know, I think I'm stuck on the fourth why, but I, but I. No, you just, I, you solved it on three, I think. Yeah. You no, know? well, you know, it's funny. I, and I'll tell you a quick other uh, little story that, uh, you know, it's funny. My, uh, I, I started negotiating at a young age. I figured out stuff, um, which of course is um, being, you know, like used against me uh, by my kids. But um, I, when I was, when I was a kid and I wanted to go, next door to my buddy's house, my, my, my friend's house to stay overnight. I remember my sister wanted to do that with her friend. And so she went up to my mother and she said, you know, mom, I want to stay at so-and-so. So my mom said, no, absolutely not. And then my, my sister started getting hysterical, ran to her room, slammed the door. Mm -hmm. Then I went to my mom and I said, I want to go stay at so-and-so's house, uh, my buddy. And she said, no, absolutely not. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, because you need to do your homework. And then I said, well, if I get my homework done, blah, blah, blah. She said, well, you haven't done your chores. And if I said, well, if I do my chores, then blah, blah, blah. And then, and then you know, it kept on going. And finally, she caved in if I did everything. So I, I think I did, I beat her down with the, the, the whys and so forth uh, back then. Um, you did. But, but it's that's, interesting because I think. That's not, you. yeah, you, you were using the why technique again with, uh, not against your mother. You were having your mother do the why technique. Mm. She did. She didn't necessarily know why she was saying no, probably. She just knew that she wanted this goal accomplished and right. you, you hadn't done it. But you can't go do anything else because you haven't done this. You can't do anything until this, that's what she was focused on. So you had her go through her whys, excuse me, and you found out where that was coming from. And she realized she was mindful at that point and was able to, you know, come to an agreement with you. That's, that's really cool. So before I forget, for all of you watching, please feel free to put uh, your questions down. There's a question box down below somewhere and we can uh, answer those. But one question I have is this, um, I know that you've, um, you know, you're a performance coach among other things, um, but let me ask you, um, and I know what your answer is gonna be, but do, I mean, is it important for an athlete to have a, a performance coach and I guess that's a big term because it can be mental it could be physical it could be all kinds of things but do you think that you know how important to you is is coaching or having a coach to I mean how has it been critical to your success and that sort of thing it's huge actually um you you have your own opinions but like think of it in, in the business world like as a um when you're kind of trying to come up with a you know parallel solution to something that you're thinking of in a straightforward situation, what's the best way to do uh, to find another perspective? You ask a colleague, or you know, you, you know, you brainstorm. You, you get you know, you talk to somebody and you get feedback, or you ask questions and get feedback, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're making sideways connections, lateral connections. Uh, it's the same thing with sports. Nowadays, it's so much easier because we have video and, you know, you can video yourself and really watch the tapes and but you still need to have somebody in a, a different opinion or an, uh, another a coach or, you know, whatever it may be um, to tell you, hey, wait, you're not doing this because you might not even recognize it. 
you're not lifting your left leg high enough. I thought no. I was. Yeah, I thought I was. So, I mean, coaching is the, like, um, support, I guess. Not co not necessarily coaching or because we could, like you said, there's so many different kinds of coaches. Um, we call it support. And it's your entourage is what we call it. Um, because, you, in a lot of, you know, times throughout your life, you have to change, you know, look at your entourage and change it. Um, sometimes you outgrow part of your entourage and you have to replace it. So coaches, trainers, um, in different teams, biofeedback teams, myofascial teams, um, even, you know, mental training coaches, life coaches. So you need to constantly be um, mindful of your situation, what you're trying to accomplish. Is this person being helpful or are they hindering me? And do I need to take another look at my, my entourage? It, no. It's one of the top five things that uh, in, my, in, in my list of things that you need to be a successful lead athlete. So how do you know when, when you need to, let's say, uh, is there a moment where you say, you know what, I need to call my fill in the blank coach, my, whether it's mindset coach, my, you know, is there a moment where you say, you know what, I need help? Or is it just something where it's easier to receive that feedback on a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever it is? Yeah, no, a lot of times you don't know it. Like, that's the whole point. Like, if you don't get feedback from, like, unless you're videotaping yourself, say, like, you videotape yourself and you see that you're not picking both your knees up at the same height. Mm -hmm. And then you go out and you practice it five times and videotape yourself again, and then, then you see that. But otherwise, there's, I mean, you can be doing something your whole life and not know it's wrong until somebody tells you it's wrong. I have a very deep philosophical part of that, but I won't go into that. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, one of, one of the questions that someone's asking right now is they're saying, look, you know, what, um, you know, what is it that you do? I mean, do you have sort of... Um, I mean, the question is really, what do you do pre-race to prepare? But I think that's too, too, almost too vague. But is there something that you kind of do the night before and then the day of and then the hour before and then the moments before? I mean, they're, are they similar or are they different or what, what do you do? Oh, yeah, no, there's a, I have a, a pre-game checklist. I have a um, night before checklist. I have a, um, this is a good time to plug my Head Sharp app. That's Head Sharp. <laughs> um, it's an app for uh, the new generation where it's, it's mental training where it, it's it broken down into these little bit chunks of perfect sized um, information for kids nowadays and, and, you know, young adults. And they, you, you build, it teaches you to, you know, you have this list and it has an automatic response to, your pregame, you have your pregame list in there, what you do exactly before. Like I said, I show up to a race. I make sure to have my hood up. I have my sunglasses on. I have my earbuds in tight. Don't talk to anybody. I don't even get dressed in the same locker room. I find a space to warm up um, by myself. I don't talk to anybody about it because I don't want anybody else as a negativity, negativity or, um, mm. you know, criticism or I don't want, I have a plan already. I don't want to hear about yours. Um, I don't want to hear about your problems. I don't want to hear about your negativity. And, you know, so I already have my own mindset and I'm going to keep it that way. I have my, my playlist is set exactly the way I want it. I know I actually have two playlists, depending on how I'm feeling that morning. If I'm anxious, um, I have this like, don't worry, be happy kind of playlist. And if I'm too lackadaisical, I, I listen to like techno EDM to get pumped up. Uh, cool. Like, yeah, I have different situations. There's all now kinds I, of different stuff for pre pre performance. Night before, sleep is so important. Recovery, um, during sleep, obviously. Um, you can mentally train before while you're being mindful before you fall asleep. You do your your mental your visualization technique. Um, I do visualization like as I'm waiting to get into the gate. Now we've heard that uh, you know I th it's it's pretty universal that sleep is critical and um you know there's 
for for so many different reasons right and but what's happening and you know this as well as anybody that you know every it's interesting as technology continues to make our lives sort of easier they also fill our lives with more things and so we tend to now be awake longer because we're looking at our phones or looking at our screens or doing whatever it is or maybe we did that all day long but longer so now we're doing other things that that we go to sleep later and we wake up earlier and that sort of thing um you know and 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 from what i understand and i might be totally wrong but i know that the first couple of hours of sleep is is i mean the most important hours are really the sort of the the fifth sixth seventh eighth not necessarily the first four but you got to get to the first through the first four to get to those later ones and that's why it's important to have so much more sleep but now in your case barbie do you have a certain amount that you try to get every night or is there it's a lot of nights you're at let's say six seven eight and then you know before a race you do 12 or how do you how do you do it um uh, yeah there's actually very it's very specific i have to have at least eight hours of sleep um i do heart rate variability training which means i can know how to control my heart rate using breathing techniques um and what you're saying about uh the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep that's all those are all things i'm i keep in my journal how many hours you sleep last night it has to be at least a quality of sleep um the actually i just read a study that said that um the happier the person the longer it takes them to get an REM sleep like 120 minutes was the longest and that means you're just an ecstatic person and the, the more depressed you are the, the quicker you fall into um REM sleep really yeah so it's uh, it, it's it's beneficial to um I'm actually working with um, audio um, brainwave techniques right now, and uh, it's just that's a whole nother subject. But um, like beta, theta, you know, how to get into those states that that put you into that REM sleep. REM sleep is when all the magic happens. That's what you're talking about. Um, but it, but it, I guess I'm confused. Why? Um, I, mean, I don't know. look. But the whole concept of if I'm positive, if I'm a happy guy, which I like to think I'm a pretty happy guy, mm -hmm. I, I would think it would take me less time to be like, woo, everything's great. So therefore, I'm, I'm relaxed. I can get into REM. Whereas maybe some people otherwise are like stressed out about all kinds of things. It takes them longer. So you're saying it's the other way around. Yeah. It's the, it, you, the, the better that your conscience feels, um, it doesn't need to get to that state of recovery as quickly. Interesting. I, yeah so but there's also active recovery that you can do that you do during the day like today was an active recovery day for me um you know the, you take a break from well, we we do what's 90 called 90 30 training and it's 90 minutes hard on 30 minutes off you can't go to burnout and you know you can't just go five six hours straight so it's 90 minutes on and then 30 minute break and um the same thing goes for like anything else. Like if you're in a business, so you know people are bragging about their 120 hour work weeks, or their you know that kind of stuff. It's, they're gonna burn out. They're gonna they're not gonna have the the fresh perspectives and the new ideas. Those are not people that are gonna climb the corporate ladder. Those are people that are gonna burn out and fall off the ladder. Um, it, those are the ones you need to have a recovery time. And I highly suggest a digital Sabbath on Sundays. Digital you, what? Digital Sabbath on Sundays. If you can't do a whole whole 24 hours, um, I need to plug this in. Um, I'm gonna keep talking while I do this. But if you can't do a whole 24 hours, you can at least do, you know, 12 hours. It's hard to do at first. It might, maybe you have to do, uh, you know, just a couple hours at a time. But well. eventually, I mean, I'm I'm pretty successful at that. Um, when I sleep, I turn everything off. There's, I just read an article about people, how many times people check their phone, and there's something like an astounding statistic about um, yeah. how many people check their phone in the middle of the night. Oh, really? Yeah, in the middle of the night. What's the best way to get a hold of you if they want, if there's someone's interested in, in not just a mental toughness coach but a performance coach, et cetera, and they want to know more about what you do? Um, I can be reached at, wow, I'm really crooked now, aren't I? Um, I can be reached at agent, spelled out, at transcendentathletesplural.com. That's my email address. 
or I am on Instagram at ice underscore ice underscore Barbie, ice ice Barbie. Um, and on Facebook, I think I'm ice to Barbie or just search for my full name, Barbie Cook. And I, yeah, I, I, I'll respond to any of those. Best way to reach me is via email. I'll probably respond fastest to that. Got it. I don't, I think they might have published an article or something when I was in France, but I came back and for a month straight, I got like 60 emails or, or I'm sorry, 60 uh, friend requests like per hour from France. And I don't even speak French. So they were like, oh, all trying to become my friend and I had no idea why. Well, I got some ideas. I think that, look, the bottom line is that, <laughs> you know, the bottom line is you know your stuff though and i think that uh you know, you know from my perspective it's really important um i did you know it's funny i i was i had a a, a guy uh recently on on this on this show that uh he was he's a professional hockey player and he said that what's so important to an athlete is trying to figure out and i mentioned this earlier you know how do you get one percent better how do you just get that little bit better than you were today or yesterday and and the thing is that, you know, when you reach certain physical limitations and you can't lift anymore, you can't run any faster. I mean, maybe you can, but maybe this is holding you back. So, you know, I think it's important to have somebody that can really demonstrate mental toughness. And as you said earlier, Barbie, it's not mental toughness as an err. It's just being mentally in a place that you're ready and you're, you're overcoming fear and you're, you're ready to be a victor, right? You're ready to, to win that's yeah it's um it's actually called the four percent rule the what you're talking about and it's if it's the fact that you try to become four percent better than you were yesterday meaning try something new today and there's always something whether it be you're not getting you don't have to try to get become better at your profession or your sport um maybe it's a, a jump that you want to conquer well, I'm going to do it today, whether I'm ready or not. It's going to hurt if I don't make it. Oh, well. Um, but there's always something that you can do, no matter in, in any form, that will make you 4% better than the day before. I like that. The 4% better rule. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And I think I told you this about the study with um, the basketball players where they lost the uh, championship and they the coach needed the – needed the team to become, you know, he told them, you know, I need you to become 10% better by next year. And athletes being what they are, competitive, very competitive, they're like 10%, that's not them, I can do that. So these guys all became, you know, 15, 20% better than they were the year before and then went on the next year, next year to, to you know, dominate the league. That's cool. So, uh, look, we're going to wrap up right here, Barbie, but listen, I, I truly appreciate your time and your knowledge. I mean, you're, you know, you've accomplished so much in your life and you've been not just, uh, and continue to be an elite athlete, but you are also demonstrating how to be more successful as an athlete. And, uh, so I encourage everybody who is participating and those who will watch this on replay to reach out to Barbie directly and get some of that, uh, that expertise. And uh, mention again the app you you developed. Uh, that's not my app. It's my sponsor. Um, I am in cahoots with them. I am working on an extreme sports part of it because it's more in general for team sports or um, taekwondo or, or martial arts and you know stuff like that. But there's nothing really for just like extreme athletes. So I'm going to be working on that part of it. But um, it's called Head Sharp. Head sharp. Got Head it. sharp. And you can download the app and then go through a few of the buttons, the radio buttons, and uh, see what it's like. Um, get a taste of it, experience it, and you'll just be like, this is so simple. And these, these five minute, you know, explainer videos and practices and questions are helping me so much that you're going to want to just dive into it. Oh, that's, that's great. So, Thank you so much for being on board. You know, it's this is exactly what we try to do with this MYM Live series is to have someone like you who has not only been and continues to be an athlete and in that space, but also you're, you're bringing together um, an additional expertise. And 
you know, clearly I think you're in a, an amazing position to whenever the time comes that you decide to hang up those skates and not do the ice cross anymore or uh, do the, the sailing anymore, whatever it might be, you, you're in a great position to transition to your next career. And I, I mean, you're already doing a lot of that. So congratulations to you and everything that you do. And I truly appreciate you being on board today. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate being here. Thanks for having me. And uh, enjoy the snow outside. That looks pretty damn cool. I could see it. Did you not just see it was sunny and the boat, a boat was going by a minute ago? And now it's sunny. There you go. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, all the best. Thanks again, Barbie. Thanks, Mark.